Oh, that's done. But the view is okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll just give it a minute for people to get in and we'll I'll introduce Steve to give his announcement and we'll move from there. Okay, so uh, welcome back uh, to our CSDE seminar series. Uh, we're gonna start with an announcement that Steve Goudreau is going to give, and then we will introduce our speakers and our panelists uh, for today. So take it away, Steve. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so I have the pleasure of uh, awarding to one of our CSTE staff a certificate from the university for 15 years of continuous service. The university does this um, for all of its um, uh, employees. Um, and um, so many of you know Devin Hamilton. Um, Devin has been working with um, the HIV modeling, STV modeling, social networks. Uh, group here on campus uh, that Martina Morris and I and a bunch of other folks um, um, uh, are, are part of as well. And Deb has been a star member of our group for a long time. He's held a number of other roles along the way, um, but then um, his position was um, was turned into a staff position at CSTD a few years ago. And to all of his research on disparities and demography and, and dynamics. Um, also teaches workshops at CSCE, provides service within CSCE, um, teaches a great workshop in age based modeling that I know is really popular. Maybe some of you have taken, and I think you can pick it up yet. Maybe some more. Um, and so, um, so Devin's been with us for, with the university as a staff member for 15 years. And so, well off, and he gets some sort of award. And um, yes, you're welcome. Oh, no, I'm looking at the campus there. You know, <laughs> hey, uh, so thanks a lot. So uh, uh, now we'll move on to the main event. Uh, so uh, first, uh, CSD acknowledges that we are located on Coast Salish territory, uh, the traditional territory of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, and other Native peoples. This land is a uh, this land acknowledgement is but one small gesture in the ongoing process of working toward repairing and sustaining relations with Coast Salish lands, waters, peoples, and their other than human kin. Uh, CSDE's commission logo from Native artist UW professor Marvin Oliver acknowledges these vital connections to Native peoples and territories. Uh, CSDE is extremely grateful for support from the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance, the School of Public Health, the School of Social Work, the Business School, the Population Health Initiative, the eScience Institute, and the Associate Provost uh, for Research. So today we have a panel uh, uh, per, that uh, Jenny Romick put together, uh, and she's going to introduce our panelists as well as uh, moderate the Q&A session. So uh, take it away, Jenny. All right. Thank you, Peter, and congratulations, Devin. Um, I learned the hard way here that we have no applause emoji in, in this particular format, but I was putting that up in, in recognition of your um, service to the university. All right. Um, I am Jenny Romick. I'm a longtime CSDE affiliate, a faculty member in social work and director of the West Coast Poverty Center. And um, one of the best parts of my job is getting to work um, with other folks in Washington State um, who care about the well being of the people of our state. Um, and today I'm going to, um, I'm proud and pleased to have a, a mini panel of um, two folks who work at the Department of Social and Health Services. Um, and I think for CSDE, and they're also both CSDE regional affiliates. Um, and I think um, from the CSDE perspective, this is a case of um, 
make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other is gold, to quote, you know, uh, uh, the 4-H camp song from my youth. Um, so we have a new friend, um, someone who is, well, Taylor Danielson, who's a research manager at DSHS, a senior research manager there um, in their research and data analysis division. Um, Taylor is a social scientist with expertise in quantitative research and secondary data analysis, as well as some survey development. Um, RDA, the research and data analysis development division does all of that. Um, Taylor's substantive interests include public opinion, social services, poverty alleviation, and social policy, all topics dear to my heart as well. Um, his PhD in sociology he earned from the University of Arizona, um, and he's our new friend in that he joined CSDE as a regional affiliate earlier this year. Um, he'll be speaking first about um, the work that RDA does, um, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce our old friend, um, another regional affiliate here, uh, Dr. Delina Patton. Um, she has been a CSDE um, regional affiliate since 2021, but might not sound that old, but she also earned her PhD in sociology from the University of Washington um, and hung around here during that time. So uh, she's also a research manager at DSHS RDA. Um, Deanna's research focuses on child and family well-being with connections to policy areas in DSHS and, and beyond, including economic services, early childhood, infant and maternal um, health and well-being and child welfare, and her PhD here was from the sociology department, um, and she'll be talking about um, maternal well-being of our state's TANF population. So um, Taylor will give a brief 15-20 minute presentation, Delina will do the same. Um, if you have questions at any point, put them in the Q&A. Um, we can do any quick clarifying questions during, but we're going to hold substantive discussion questions until the end of both talks. So, all right, Taylor, thank you. Thank you. So hello everyone, and thank you all for having us to speak with you today a little bit about what we do at the Research and Data Analysis Division at the Department of Social and Health Services. And uh, to tell you a little bit about the resources that we have available, the types of research we do, and um, kind of what the overall research process looks like when you work in this realm versus the academic realm. So my talk today is going to be on using integrated administrative data to inform policy and an introduction to Washington's research and data analysis division, as you can see. And what I want to accomplish today is just a, I want to briefly describe who we, RDA, are as an organization, the types of data that we have access to in what we call our integrated client database with which some of you may already be familiar with. I know Jenny has worked with some of our data and has worked very closely with some of our senior research managers here. Um, and talk a little bit about how we use that data to support our state agency partners. And then I wanna review the strengths and weaknesses of administrative data because there are both strengths and weaknesses and some of those weaknesses are pretty substantial, but they're outweighed a lot of the time by some of the other information that we have access to. And then very briefly, as a setup for Delina's presentation, I'm going to provide some examples of the types of data products that we've generated using the integrated client database. So RDA is located within the Department of Social and Health Services under the Facilities Finance and Analytics Administration, and we are under the governor. And we are an somewhat of an, I would argue, independent research organization in that while we are located within DSHS, we do a lot of work with other state agency partners, including the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, the state's health care authority, which oversees Medicaid programs, the Department of Commerce, which does work on homelessness and housing services, and a variety of other agencies as well. So we actually uh, engage with other groups beyond just those agencies and organizations within DSHS. And this is because of the wealth of information that we have access to and what we call our integrated client database. So the integrated client database is something that we've developed over several decades now. And it really started in the mid 1990s 
with a small group of programmers and researchers who realized that we have a number of clients who are utilizing services from various state agencies and agencies within DSHS, and that we really didn't have a good sense of how much those client populations overlapped and what the costs were uh, that were associated with those clients. So a group of folks got together and they kind of did the Skunk Works project where they were working in the background for two to three years, and they were able to, they did some work to be able to, to identify and link records across administrative data systems, which sounds relatively simple, but in practices actually can be difficult. And in doing so, they developed what we call the client services database, which has information on the types of services that individuals receive within DSHS. As time marched along, our director, who was then, I believe, a research manager or our office, the office chief for Delina and I's section, uh, actually, they he applied for a grant from a federal agency, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, or Services Administration, and we were awarded this grant, and he used that to take what we had in the CSDB and start bringing in additional information on outcomes from data outside of DSHS. So this included things like in, involvement with the criminal legal system, uh, the Medicaid services, uh, services from, uh, or birth and health or death information from the Department of Health, employment information from the Employment Security Department, which they track all information on individuals who um, are employed in the state of Washington who aren't self-employed or federally employed. And then uh, other information from the Washington State Patrol, where we have information on or data on arrests, which have resulted in a fingerprinting. So what we've done in pulling all this information together is it allows us to do a variety of different types of projects that are, can really support our agency partners by giving them a better sense of who they're serving, what the range of their service needs are, and then also allow us to do evaluations where we can look at a number of different outcomes outside of those that may be narrowly in scope for the agency that we're looking at. So, uh, for example, we can look at things like um, not only did this program result in higher engagement with mental health treatment services, but did it result? Did it reduce uh, emergency department visits? Did it reduce arrests? Did it uh, increase employment rates? So that's the sort of things. Those are the sorts of things that we like to do with our data uh, and the way that we support our agency partners. And you, you can see on this slide, just to give you a sense of the scope of the information that we have available to us. We have things like long-term support service information, which includes whether or not somebody's in a residential care facility, adult family home, assisted living, nursing facilities, uh, et cetera. We have information on behavioral health needs. So what types of behavioral health needs do you have? Do you have a substance use disorder? Do you have a mental health disorder? Is it schizophrenia versus depressive disorders? Well, those sorts of things. We also have information on the state psychiatric hospitals as well as community mental health hospitals if they're paid through, paid for using Medicaid funds. Uh, we have information on individuals who are receiving supplemental nutrition assistance, uh, pro, or benefits through the supplemental nutrition assistance program, excuse me. Uh, individuals receiving TANF, so temporary assistance for needy families, and other cash and food assistance programs, uh, employment information, arrest information, and all the other things that I've covered already. Other types of analysis we do, and I would encourage you to go to our website, we do have geographic analysis where we look at differences across communities in the state, specifically counties, and you can see what their risk profiles look like. And we have uh, also used our data to do forecasting as well to help with identifying potential populations that would benefit from some sort of service and what that caseload would look like over time and what the potential costs and offsets would be. And for those of you who may be thinking about data security and data protection, one of the key, key things of, uh, to keep in mind is that we are linking this data across data systems, but we are de-identifying the data for our researchers. We rely on a research identifier to link the records for our own work, and that we are, we do, this data does reside in a HIPAA compliant server, and we are very careful about seeking approval from our state agency partners for the use of their data for uh, different projects, and we are our projects are overseen by the Washington State Institutional Review Board. So we have a lot of 
various institutional protections in place to make sure that we're we're using client data appropriately and that it's we're not exposing them to vulnerabilities. So, and uh, one other thing just before I progress, another thing we do that's not listed here is we also support external researchers. So we have worked with Jenny in the past on the minimum wage study and actually provided uh, a data extract from our data system that had information on a variety of different uh, indicators that, that she was able to use for some projects and her team was able to use. So um, that is something else that we do as well. Now this sounds wonderful, right? This is a lot of very interesting information, and it's based on actual events. And for me, coming from my background, where I often work with public opinion data and, and large survey data, this is sort of the gold standard, right? You want to be able to have data on actual events, because most often you're sort of in the realm of just doing research on what people tell you they did or what or telling you about what happened to them. And it there and that's true. This is very powerful data in that regard, but it's also limited in a number of different ways that's important to keep in mind. So one thing to keep in mind with administrative data is that anything that's unrelated to day-to-day -day business operations may not be current in the information that we're looking at. And what I mean by that is that every state agency is performing a particular task and they're doing a particular kind of work. And so things that are related to their day-to-day -day business operations, I'll pick on the Economic Services Administration for a moment, their job, uh, their, their job is to determine eligibility for state benefits. If there is information that's re relevant for determining eligibility for state benefits, like family income, family composition, things of that nature, it will be up to date because that's necessary for their day-to-day -day business operations. But if it's not related to that, it may be updated infrequently or not at all past that first interview with a client or a client's household. So that's one weakness of this data. Uh, another weakness is that administrative data may not include all analytically or theoretically relevant information. So one of the questions I get a lot in my body of work, where I work a lot on projects related to homelessness, is what do you have information on sexuality or gender identity? And the answer to the first question is no because state administrative systems do not gather information on sexuality in any sort of concerted way. Uh, and I suspect they won't ever because that could be considered very invasive. Um, the other, and then with regard to gender, yes, but, because it's, it's very, it's very binary. They've been making changes to the state administrative data systems to adjust for shifts in gender identification, but state data systems are very slow moving and it requires a large amount of money to be able to make adjustments to them. So some of those sorts of items we will not have information on. Another one that's really interesting is household composition. So Jenny and some of her students have had an opportunity to, to grapple with this issue. So some programs, sometimes household composition is determined by program. It's not necessarily something that we, or, or we have to construct it ourselves, but it's not necessarily something that will make its way in if it's not relevant for a program. So we may be missing that information. Another key thing is if somebody didn't receive services, we're not going to see data on them. So our population includes individuals who've come into contact with the criminal legal system or who have received a DSHS benefit or received Medicaid or some other state benefit. But anybody outside of that, we have no information on. So uh, that is very analytically challenging when we when we get questions like how many individuals are in poverty in the state of Washington? We can give you information on who on the DSHS caseload meets those poverty standards, but we can't give you broader information about the state population as a whole. Um, quickly getting through the, the remaining three items. So state agencies differ in how they collect and record key data elements. This includes race, ethnic, race ethnicity data. So sometimes some agencies may be perfectly willing to say, oh, somebody did not identify as a particular group member, we're just going to leave that blank. Others may be required by some federal statute to provide that information or assign it if they have to, if somebody's in the office, even if they don't volunteer that information. So there are some differences there. Uh, research using linked administrative data really requires you to understand what that data means. You have to, you have to be familiar with the, uh, the programs that you're looking at what program participation means, uh, what the benefits are, what the eligibility requirements are, and also uh, how that 
may result in potential, um, you know, potential missing data patterns and things like that. And then finally, uh, you know, I was going through, we have a lot of different legal protections in place to ensure that we're protecting our clients' privacy. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, those protections that are in place for our clients are also things that make it difficult to use the data because the data are subject, subject to various legal protections that restrict their use. And so for, again, from my perspective and the work that I do with regard to homelessness services, for example, uh, the Department of Commerce will not release those records to any external researchers. Uh, because there's, it's very clearly laid out in their consent form, there's only three entities that can use those records. Similarly, the Healthcare Authority and the Department of Children, Youth, and Families are very concerned about who's using their records and why, so they have a lot of oversight on, uh, on that use, and they want to make sure that they're protecting their clients. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of hoops you have to jump through to get access to that information. So now I'm going to move into, you know, I noted earlier that we do a number of different types of data products for our program partners. So I'm going to very briefly go through a couple of different examples of the types of work we do that relate to different substantive areas that I work on and just give you a sense of how these projects came about, uh, some of the key findings and the and kind of just what they are. So the first example is sort of descriptive work that we do. You'd be amazed at how important descriptive information is for our program partners and to be able to take information from these multiple data systems and provide them with a more holistic picture of the clients that they're serving. And so that's often something that we work on with our program partners is just simple questions like, what is the mental health treatment need? or mental health disorder rate look like for this particular population? Are we underserving them in that regard? Can we connect them to services better? And so one thing that we do on a semi-annual basis for the Department of Commerce is produce a youth homelessness dashboard. And this really came out of a desire to understand how many youth are exiting particular state systems of care, which include things like uh, inpatient behavioral health facilities, foster care, and uh, juvenile justice facilities, and just see how many of those youth are becoming homeless within a given period of time, and then to understand where they're becoming homeless so that we can make sure that the service delivery system is aligned with the location of those youth and where they're ending up. And so some key findings from this project is that the largest number of youth, so just in raw numbers, the largest number of youth and young adults who become homeless following exit are exiting behavioral health and patient facilities. They tend to be the largest population overall, and they tend to have the highest number of individuals who become homeless in the 12 months following exit. Homelessness rates are highest among youth or young adults who are exiting criminal legal facilities. So you can see down here, we have the, the uh, actual percent who became homeless following exit, and it's much, it's much higher for those who are um, coming out of the criminal legal system relative to those who are exiting from other state systems of care. And then we noted very distinct disparities in terms of who is becoming homeless. So we were seeing, uh, compared to individuals who exited and did not become homeless, we saw that uh, those who became, who experienced homelessness, were more likely to be Black or African American. They tended to be between the ages of 18 to 24. So we're doing a much better job serving those who are below the age of 18 relative to those who are older. Uh, they were more likely to be readmitted back into a state system of care, uh, have a, some indication of a substance use disorder, and then based on child welfare records, have some indication of having experienced prior abuse or neglect. Another type of work that we do a lot is, so that was sort of a descriptive, what we call descriptive profiles or dashboards. We also will do full-blown reports where we do a write-up about a particular program. This typically happens with uh, pilot programs where we're providing analytic support to a state agency partner for something that they're working on. And so an example of this from one of my projects was uh, the Better Health Through Housing program, which was actually established via a legislative proviso, so a budget proviso, which funded the program directly. And it was, it's instructed the Department of Commerce to work with what are known as accountable communities of health, which are regional coordinating entities, to uh, identify high need chronically homeless individuals and to serve them, to house them. 
And so this was, we ended up selecting Spokane for the project. And we focused in on a population of individuals who have significant behavioral health needs and who had visited the emergency department four more times in the past year. Those were sort of some of the criteria that they needed to, to meet in order to be able to be eligible for the program. And when we applied those restrictions and we and we ran the program in Spokane, what we found was that the program participants were predominantly older males, uh, which is atypical because the uh, the homeless population doesn't necessarily skew older because of higher mortality rates. So they they tend to be older. They tend to be up on that upper end of the risk continuum in terms of age. And then they also suffered from substantially higher rates of chronic illness. So uh, they they had more illnesses that affected multiple organ systems. They had more serious illnesses. They had uh, suffered from heart conditions, skin uh, infections, infectious diseases, all at higher rates than what you would observe in the broader Medicaid population that's in the Spokane region. And they were also three times more likely to have experienced a traumatic brain injury at some point in time. And then the one of the key takeaways, and, and I think that obviously this is a selection effect because we're focusing in on a homeless po uh, group of individuals who are experiencing homelessness who are high ED utilizers. But we have in these bar charts at the bottom, this is the gray chart is the average utilization rate for individuals who are in the Spokane region more generally. So Medicaid clients above the age of 18. And then the blue bar is uh, are the individuals who are enrolled in the program. And you can see their, their ED utilization was 22 times higher over a 12 month period relative to other Medicaid clients in the region. They uh, were hot, they had a nine time uh, rate of, that was nine times higher for non-ED visits. Uh, their hospitalization rate was 25 times higher and their days hospitalized was 18 times higher relative to the average Medicaid client in the region. So really high need population being served. A uh, third type of project we'll do, and I, again, kind of going back to what I was talking about at the beginning, we will do projects on predictive modeling. And so what we'll, we'll do is estimate a series of models to try and identify high risk populations or populations that may be underserved. And so I was working with another research manager here on uh, a grant for that the healthcare authority received to help them better understand what the substance use disorder treatment system in Washington state looks like, how to improve that system, and how to, and areas where we could improve and address potential disparities. And so as part of this work, we did a predictive modeling project where we use binary logic models uh, to identify those factors associated with substance use disorder treatment uptake among Medicaid clients. And we split this out, recognizing that utilization patterns might be different between individuals who've been treated previously and those who would not. We split it out by that. And we also split it out by uh, modal treatment modality, so outpatient, inpatient, or medication treatment. And what we found is that, and this is all would then be packaged up and reported back to the federal funding agency to provide them information on what we're doing, what we need to do next, and, and where the shortcomings of our system are, and why we're doing a good job. And so um, what we found, very briefly, more than half of Medicaid clients with a substance use disorder had not received treatment in the prior two years. So that's a substantial number. And then of those individuals, only 10% of those who had not been treated in the past two years access treatment in our post period. And then uh, as opposed to 62% of those individuals who had re previously received treatment. So there's a very large proportion of individuals who have a substance use disorder who have not accessed treatment and they're substantially less likely to access treatment. And, in the post period. And that's you know, very important because it's not a small number of individuals. And then we noticed that there were disparities in access to treatment. It tended to vary by modality. So there were some, some modalities where uh, communities of color were less likely to access services. We did notice that individuals uh, who are older tend to access treatment services at a lower rate just kind of across the board. And that there were some disparities between men and pregnant women or I'm sorry, women who are not pregnant. 
And then the other thing uh, that we found that was very surprising was that contact with emergency departments, the criminal legal system, and child protective services were associated with greater uptake of SUD treatment. Uh, with regard to EDs, one hypothesis is that this is because they're coming into contact with a crisis healthcare system and they're being pushed into treatment because it's they've hit a point where they they understand that the, they really need treatment at this point. And then with regard to the other two um, organizations or or um, service systems, those that might be because there's a coercive aspect to this, right? You are being forced to engage in treatment as part of your uh, your sentencing or in order to retain um, custody of your children. So we want to dig more into that as we move along. Uh, the last example, and then I'll kick it over to Delina, is an evaluation. We do evaluations all the time. We typically will do a match comparison group analysis and then use difference and difference to, look, to compare trends over time for the two groups. Uh, I was involved with the Becoming Employed Starts Today pilot program, which really focused on providing supported employment services to individuals with serious mental illness. And this was funded using a, uh, for five years by federal funds. And what we found in this study was that best participants experienced significant improvements in their employment rates, their hours worked, and the numbers of quarters that they worked relative to the match comparison group. So you can see that at the bottom, just that kind of, it was a sustained increase in employment. Um, their arrest rates also declined between the pre and the post period at a faster or faster rate relative to the uh, comparison group. And then they also engaged in outpatient mental health services more, and they reported significant reductions in feelings of psychological distress and improvements in overall functioning. And these sorts of results are really important because they form the bedrock of any arguments for additional expansion of these types of services. So when you do a pilot program, Oftentimes, you have to be able to demonstrate that the program was effective in order to be able to justify getting additional funding to expand it to other areas and do a multi-site test. So this sort of result is very helpful in building that body of evidence that then uh, state agency partners and advocates can use to go to the legislature and ask for additional funding. So I will stop there and turn things over to Delina. I don't know, are there any I don't see any questions in the Q&A. So uh, I think with that, I'll turn it over to you, Delina. OK, let me pull up my slides. All right. So uh, yeah, thanks for inviting us. It's nice to be back as part of the CSDE seminar. Um, as an old friend, I was a trainee and came to a lot of these, so it's really cool to come uh, back and do one. So um, I'll be presenting today on some uh, relatively recent work I've worked on looking at the maternal well-being of Washington State's um, TANF population. So just to orient everyone, uh, TANF is uh, the, tempor the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. It provides temporary cash assistance to families in need and um, the average monthly payment per case uh, as of state fiscal year 2021 was about $470. Um, Washington state residents are eligible if they are responsible for the care of a child or pregnant, uh, meet income resource and citizenship requirements. Um, certain non, uh, ineligible non-citizens may receive what's called state family assistance, which is basically the same um, cash assistance program and um, work support program, but funded with state funds because of restrictions on federal funds. Um, and this program is administered uh, in Washington state by the uh, GSHS Economic Services Administration. So um, for this study, the program partner that um, asked for this work to do be done was the e um, Economic uh, Services Administration. So like Taylor said, we are working, uh, what's different between our work and academic work is we are getting questions and um, talking to leaders from uh, various program partners and um, answering what they really want to know um, about their programs. So the research question that came up in conversations with leadership at ESA was um, understanding more about people who give birth while they're on TANF, how they are doing and um, how the babies are doing. So first of all, just what are the characteristics, that descriptive information that Taylor talks about that is so valuable to our program partners, um, what barriers they face uh, prior to birth, then um, looking specifically at birth outcomes, 
um, and how the uh, people who've given birth and their babies are faring during the postpartum period. And then finally, what service gaps we can identify to serve this population better. Um, kind of blowing out of that kind of bigger picture, what's the rationale for looking at this population? Well, for, first of all, uh, mothers and children make up a substantial portion of clients served by the TANF program. Now, as I said before, anyone caring for a child can receive TANF, but just in, in terms of the caseload, um, it is often uh, mothers and their children. Um, at this time, and I'd say now continuing forward, uh, birth outcomes, maternal mortality, and early childhood development have come up, come under really increasing policy interest. Um, and especially disparities in these outcomes um, across race, across socioeconomic status. That's an area um, that people want to know more about. Um, additionally, the TANF program uh, serves some of the most vulnerable families in the state. Just if you look at the eligibility criteria, the level of assets and income that you need to qualify for the program, it's, it's um, quite vulnerable uh, economically. And then um, additional context is uh, increased focus I'd say at the state and the federal level on prevention and cross-system um, involvement. So by prevention here, I mean um, prevention of like intergenerational poverty, prevention of deeper systems involvement. So coming into the child welfare system, coming into the criminal legal system, what can be done to, to prevent uh, those things from happening? And then, um, in terms of cross-system involvement, I think Taylor touched on this as well. Um, ESA is serving this TANF population. In what ways is this population engaging with um, other state systems or needs support by other sy state systems and how can different agencies that do different parts of this uh, collaborate because they're in many ways serving the same people. Um, and so just a brief um, overview of the data. So again, Taylor talked about the integrated client database where this uh, what uh, study was a bit unique is that we linked that integrated client data with what's called the first steps database and the first steps database um, is looking at uh, birth outcomes. So linking birth and death information with uh, medical information. And the reason we needed this uh, additional data source was um, having that long form birth certificate. So to know if, if TANF individuals had a birth and then to know about the birth outcomes, that's where that came from. So to do this, um, we um, had a different unit in RDA create a limited data set that included all individuals with Medicaid coverage who had a delivery of a live born infant. Um, and then the data comes from calendar year 2015. So, uh, those, the, the population size of those who are on Medicaid who gave birth to an infant is about 44,000 in that year. And then we kind of zero in on that uh, 6,900 who were also recipients of TANF or state family assistance in the year. And so we do some comparisons between this focal population and the wider Medicaid population, but I'll just run through what we found about this um, TANF population. So, Here's just an overview of the demographics of this, um, this population. Uh, modal age was around 21 to 25, 54% uh, white, the remaining percent uh, people of color. This is as reported at the time of the birth certificate. 40% uh, of the women um, had had no prior births, so 60% had had previous births. Um, the modal category for education was high school or GED equivalent, um, and the next largest category was no, no, um, no high school degree. And then 78% again uh, of the of the um, people who gave birth reported being unmarried. Um, here's some major um, barriers to well-being that we often look at to um, explain to our program partners where they may need, need, may need to give supports. Uh, to support women and those giving birth uh, with their path towards self-sufficiency. So here, um, nearly half had indicators of significant health problems based on their pattern of diagnoses and prescriptions. Uh, again, nearly half had indicators of being homeless um, or housing unstable. So literally homeless, um, living on the street or in a shelter, or um, uh, couch home housing instability would be things like couch surfing and doubling up temporarily. And this is in the 12 months prior to these people um, giving birth. 
37% uh, had an indicator of a mental health condition. 33% uh, had um, visited an emergency department more than once for outpatient um, treatment, which we use as a proxy of like using an emergency department for primary care. Um, as I said, 29% had less than high school education and 22% had indicators of substance use um, in the year prior to, to giving birth. Um, here is a measure of prenatal care based on what was um, filled out in the birth certificate. So only um, right around half had received uh, prenatal care in that first trimester, which is quite in, important for later birth outcomes. Um, something that's unique about this data as well is because it goes back to the late 90s, early 2000s, we can do some intergenerational uh, peaks at, at what's happening. So um, this we, we've limited here to women age 25 and younger. This is just based to based on when we have data to and when their birth dates would be. So we were looking at that childhood interval. And um, over half had received Tanifus children. Um, over half had been involved in the child welfare system. So this um, means broadly some report to CPS for abuse or neglect or um, involvement in foster care. And then if we focus down into foster care being placed out of home, about 12% had experienced, um, had had that experience in childhood. Um, then, you know, the focus, the birth outcomes here. So for the, for the infants, 10% uh, was a pre, were preterm births and 9% were low birth weight. And then we uh, looked at um, the well-being and health kind of over the first year of the infant's life. Um, you can see use of outpatient ED visits um, was relatively high for this population. 15% of those infants received some sort of injury treatment in their first year of life. Uh, about a quarter were reported to Child Protective Services in that year, and 8% um, were placed out of home. So. Um, that was kind of the first stage of the study was just this descriptive information. ESA then wanted us to give some information to them around, you know, what factors are most associated with negative outcomes that they could perhaps use to triage additional case management, things like that. So I'll just share one example of that using logistic regression, which, which um, factors are most associated with infant out of home placement. So I said um, previous about 8% were placed out of home. What, fa what um, factors were associated with, with that outcome? Maybe unsurprisingly, child welfare involvement in the previous 12 months was you know, related to then that child coming into care. Um, but other factors that are uh, related to increased odds of infant place out of home include some instability measures, including the homelessness measure and the criminal justice involvement measure, um, and then some health related uh, things, uh, specific, specifically substance use, smoking during pregnancy, opioid use, um, <clears throat> as well as having a, uh, receiving disability services. And then more additional children, uh, so two or, having two or more previous births is significantly related to higher odds. And then Factors related to lower odds were timely prenatal care, um, higher education, things you might expect. So I'll move, move along. So what did we learn from doing this, um, this project for ESA and what recommendations did we make? Um, so people who give birth while on TANF, they face significant barriers such as housing instability, behavioral health conditions, and low education. In addition, many of them experienced intergenerational poverty and family risk. Um, some specific service need areas include healthcare, and this runs the gamut from primary care, prenatal care, clearly, uh, family planning. We looked at some contraceptive measures that I didn't share, but that was it was a need. Um, behavioral health care and pediatric care, and then housing supports. And I want to point out here when I was talking about um, cross system involvement and like agency collaboration. Neither of those things are provided by ESA, right? ESA is the public benefits agency, and they need to collaborate to connect their population to healthcare. So Medicaid, which is overseen by um, the healthcare authority and managed care organizations, that kind of delivery system. And then housing is located over in commerce. And so just seeing how the this small population like interfaces across state systems um, is important for for. Uh, folks to realize. And then um, the recommendations we made were to make supportive and preventative services available to pregnant people. Um, 
and those who have recently given birth and, and perhaps do some triaging um, connect based on identified risk factors because there isn't always, there isn't unlimited resources. Um, and then establish strong referral networks to specific types of services that they know that they'll need over and over. So things like substance use, housing support, and legal aid. So I will pause there for questions. Great, thank you um, to both Taylor and Delina. Um, if I had an applause emoji, I would be putting it up. Um, we do have a few minutes um, for our questions from the audience. Um, you can put those into the Q&A box. Um, I don't know if we have the power to unmute you if you wanna just ask one live, but but we can try. Um, and for folks who are in the room, you have an option of um, putting them in the Q&A box if you've got a device in front of you or going up to the microphone and asking them. Um, but I'm gonna start off with one question. Um, you both um, earn PhDs in an academic setting, which is where one earns PhDs. Um, what has it been like to, to take a job in government? Um, and what do you see as kind of the, the relative advantages and maybe challenges of, of this kind of work? Um, yeah, I can go first. I think uh, it can be an advantage or disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, but um, it really is, um, it's not following your academic interest or what the literature gaps are or any any of that that you kind of learn in, in graduate school. It's really being responsive to people who want information. And so that's a bit of a shift when you go into, um, into government or into uh, non-academic is that you, you kind of have a customer and you want to bring in um, your expertise and your understanding and kind of like help ask good, get good questions out of your program partners. But it is a lot more of that kind of interaction. And, you know, it's not fancy methodologies or publishing. It's, it's a big, it's a big shift in like what the priorities um, um, are, but, uh, but yeah, but I got to stay in Washington. So that was an advantage of not having to go on a job market and move who knows where. And so, so that's a, a big advantage. I mean, I think Delina hit on a lot of the key points. I think it, it is interesting. So if you have, if you're very, someone who very much has strong research interests and you want to pursue your own um, sort of research agenda, it is a difficult place to work. If you're more willing to be flexible and really respond to the needs of others, I think it's a really, it's it's very, um, it's very rewarding because the, especially within RDA, we're sort of unique relative to some of the other shops because we do this work that spans so many domains and we have access to so much information so we get to a we get to ask a lot of interesting questions but even i mean the, the research shops that are specific to the other state agencies the work that they do directly influences policy discussions right so you generate numbers you generate counts of caseloads you do projections and all of those sorts of things very much factor into discussions about can we do this or not What's the, you know, do we have the resources available? So I think that that's really critical. Um, and it's like, it's a, what makes the job so enjoyable for me. One, Delina pointed to something, and I kind of want to highlight this. You are not dealing with researchers. You are not speaking research language with folks. These are practical people who often have very on the ground experience who've then moved into positions in state government. So their, their scope, or, or the things they're interested in may be different from what we're interested in. So they're very much focused on how do we improve services? What are the lives of the individuals we're working with? And I think that's true of the researchers here as well, but we have to guide them to the research questions, get them to think about the problem slightly differently and maybe in a, in a more macro level kind of way. And we also have to just build data literacy among them. So that's something that's a challenge is that you have to be able to teach them how to interpret the results. So this is one of the things Delina was saying about, you know, n n fancy methodology. We don't really do that. We're not doing the, the filling the research gaps. Partially that's because 
how do you take something that's complex and make it accessible is, is something we deal with all the time. And so we're trying to meet the consumers of the information where they are. And so we'll take things like predictive models with with that we've estimated using a binary logit model or whatever right and we'll we'll put it in those types of graphs where it's like what's the most important thing what's the you know or what's the protective factor what's the risk factor in air quotes because that makes it more accessible for our audience so those are the consider considerations that always come into play tables are the devil for uh for non-academic audiences just so you know like we all love tables we like looking at the parameter estimates but they don't they don't want to do it <laughs> Yes, yes. All right, sounds like a question from the room. We can't hear it. Could we drop it in the chat, maybe? If like take the question, drop it in the chat, that could work. Sorry about that. It's very hard to hear. Very, very, it's very, very faint. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um I guess the question for the is um, have you seen any or Still have to type it in chat, Jessica. It's pretty hard to hear. Yeah, I kind of got that. I, I got, I got. Did you stratify <laughs> the analyses by um, age of pre previous children? I think was the question. So that's an interesting it. question. Um, we didn't stratify by the age of the previous children. Um, that would be interesting to to look at. It just wasn't a study focus, and I and. I'll also clarify that that's the number of births. It may not be the number of living children, um, just as an FYI. So good question. Uh, it'd be it'd be interesting to look at that. And, and while, yeah, and while you're while you're putting that in the chat, I will say so. Something that Delaney just said just made me remember another thing about academic work is that there are a lot of times where we want to dig in or I'm sorry non-academic work is we really want to dig into these sorts of questions and understand them more but we often have a deliverable date where we have to have the project done by x time for them to be able to use that in the legislative session so uh so sometimes we have to just sort of stop and and move on yeah and, and also like we reach, reach a point where then it's like about communicating what we did find to um, program partners. So it's like, we share this with the leadership and then they're like, oh, our TANF um, regional leads should see this and like have a conversation. So then it becomes like, you're kind of moved towards like, okay, let's like um, make inferences and like talk to people about what we found here. So um, sometimes there's like opportunities to then go deeper and, and circle back around to things. But then sometimes it's like, okay, that was good enough for us On to the next population that we want you to look at. And um, Shayla, just so you know, that doesn't go to all of the other attendees online. So if you could repeat the question. 
Yes, absolutely. So does data link uh, cleaning, the data cleaning process slash linking between different data sources fall under your responsibility? I want to hear more about your experiences dealing with data uh, and works in, uh, and other other than actual analysis. So what are what are the most challenging parts in using ICDB data? So <clears throat> absolutely, we we do with regard to data cleaning and um, linking that does fall within RDA, but it does not fall on our side of the shop. So Delina and I work in program research and evaluation services. I'm, I always forget the S. I'm going to do a little. Yeah. Okay. I think I got. Okay. Um, but there is an analytic data integration team who also make up a pretty substantial proportion of RDA, and their job is to link the data uh, using client identifiers and to generate these curated measures that we use in our research. So that's their book of business. And you'll see, I mean, just having been involved in the development of some measures and doing this sort of cleaning, um, it's very much an iterative process where you have to work with your external agency partners. So you, it's their data. They are the experts. And that's one of the things too that's sort of interesting about being in a non-academic world. You are not necessarily the expert. You are a consultant who brings to bear a certain set of skills on a problem. But the other folks may be the substantive experts or the, or the policy expert or what have you. So when we're developing measures, what we'll typically do is say, oh, here's an interesting thing we've seen in the data. So I'll give you a, a very uh, a real world example. We noticed that in the ESA data, um, in the address field, we would see homeless appear as a literal text string. It's like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if we can harvest that for signals of homelessness and housing instability. So we started doing that. Well, okay, is this, and we noticed there are a substantial number of records associated with that. So then we go back to the agency partners and said, hey, we noticed this. What does this mean to you? Where do you think this is coming from? And they said, oh, this seems like something that people in the field are doing, or it might be flowing in from this data source. So then we go back and check, what's the frequency? Does this align with other measures? We have to do a lot of measure validation. We have to check it, what the trends are over time. There's a, There are a lot of conversations about what is and is not substantively meaningful, or does this fit into this concept? And I know Delina's been doing, I think you've been involved with the um, some of the eating disorder stuff, Delina, is that right? No. No, okay. Um, but you, but Delina's done some of the stuff too, where it's, it's like you, this measure development is very much a, okay, and now we've got this thing, let's go back and talk to the agency partners again. Let's go talk to the people who work in the offices. What did they say? Yeah. And so a lot of iteration. Yeah, you can't just look at a data set and or a set of administrative data and be like, I can definitely make a measure out of this. It's like takes a lot of processing to make sure that something has meaningful and has signal. And I, I did want to mention that the actual linking, like finding people across systems, has its own like huge process mm -hmm. and like literature around if you should do that probabilistically or determinist. Like it's a whole that that area of administrative data and how to uh, resolve identities across. Um, but that's a little outside of our yeah. expertise. We do have people, we do have dedicated staff who that's what they do. And Jenny's interacted with one of them, Buzz Campbell, who, uh, or Kevin Campbell is his, his name. He, his whole job is linking. That's, and, uh, and you know, to what Delina was saying about deterministic versus probabilistic, it's for anybody who's really interested, we use a mix. Um, one is just like exact matching versus these things look pretty close. Is this maybe the same person? But there's a lot of decision rules that go into that. And it takes a lot of time, which is part of the reason why when this was very first stood up in the early, or the mid 1990s, early 1990s, uh, it took several years to do, even just for data that was within DSHS. Uh, yeah, so we are at time. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to the clock. Um, so uh, thank you for that wonderful panel. Uh, I believe that we're trying to set something up uh, with job fair or something like that uh, uh, later on with the graduate students. Uh, join us next week, where, or not next week, next week is Thanksgiving. Join us in two weeks uh, where uh, Li Ying Lu Lau uh, will be joining us from Penn State on the gendered effects of intergenerational social mobility, uh, evidence from the GSS. 
Uh, so thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you to Taylor and Delina for um, coming here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.